Some of the hardest problems in the world exist far above the planet. Our job, to launch the smartest solutions, to protect our satellites, clean up our clutter, to propel breakthroughs in propulsion, to learn more about our place in the universe, to outpace emerging threats. Every day, the Aerospace Corporation uses the latest technologies to ensure our nation's safety and leadership in space. Hi, and welcome to the Space Policy Show. I'm your host, Rebecca Rose. As always, you can find us on Twitter using hashtag the Space Policy Show, and you can engage with our experts on Vimeo using the chat box. We also would like it if you would sign up for our latest news at aerospace.org slash policy. Today's episode is on space priorities in the U.S. House with Don Beyer. Aerospace's Jamie Morin and Representative Don Beyer will discuss congressional priorities for space traffic management, NASA funding and infrastructure, as well as workforce development, commercial space, and his love of science fiction. Jamie Morin is Executive Director of Aerospace's Center for Space Policy and Strategy. The Honorable Don Beyer was recently elected to chair the U.S. House Representative Subcommittee on Space and Aeronautics for the 117th Congress. This will be his seventh year serving on the subcommittee. Welcome and over to Jamie to get us started. Thank you, Rebecca. Well, welcome everyone back to another episode of the Space Policy Show. Our distinguished guest for today is Congressman Don Beyer, who just recently took over responsibility for the House subcommittee that provides oversight to the space enterprise. We are delighted to have him here. We are also uh, very important that we acknowledge that uh, many of the staff of the Center for Space Policy and Strategy are constituents of the congressman. So he will be on his best behavior for us today since uh, some of us are indeed his voters, although I, I have to confess I'm in Marylander now, so I, I don't have that privilege. Mr. Byer, welcome. We're delighted to have you. Jamie, thank you very much. And pl please call me Don. And uh, I am thrilled to represent uh, so many of, of your constituents. You know, I, I am the most spoiled member of Congress because you can actually see the Capitol from the end of the street that I live on. It does cut down on airplane time, I'm sure. So. Don, have you been a longtime follower of space activities or did your interest develop more recently? Uh, lots of folks we talked to about space issues, you know, had their attention captured by Apollo 11 or by a major uh, space exploration mission. What, what brought space to your radar screen? Uh, Jamie, I've been a, a science and space nerd since I was a kid. I think I read a thousand science fiction books. My favorite book for the first 40 years of my life was the Foundation Trilogy. And I got into physics pretty seriously in college. Economics major, but I love the courses on quantum mechanics and special relativity and general relativity and 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 things that you know were, were above my head, but I love just reading about them. So uh, I was, when I came to Congress, I actually asked to be on the science committee, which they said was rather unusual. <laughs> I tried to uh, explain the uh, Einstein's field equations to my son last night and realized that I had a ways to go in my understanding as well. There's nothing like trying to explain a complex topic to realize that you're absolutely ignorant. Jamie, one of the things I've been working on in my head for many years is the idea of creating a, an interactive computer video game, you know, much like Fortnite or Halo, that unfolds Einstein's special theory of relativity chapter by chapter. It has to be linear. Mm. You know, the first chapter would explain inertial frames of reference, and the second chapter would explain that light has a is a perceived constant speed of light everywhere, and and move all the way through you know Lorentz transformations. The problem is I haven't found a plot that works with my my method yet. Well, it's a uh, ample opportunity for us to geek out here today, Don. I wonder, <laughs> you know, it's easy in the space community to talk to fellow space nerds, and there is a uh, well, you have many of our team at CSPS as your constituents. I wonder what you hear from your constituents at large about space issues. They've been getting a lot of press lately. Are 
are the citizens of your district uh, feeling engaged on these topics? Does it come up regularly in conversation or is it all COVID and state of the economy? When Jamie, when we do the, the town hall meetings, especially pre-COVID, it would tend to come up once or twice. You know, frankly, the things that come up most are airplane noise, uh, helicopter noise, the safety of the GW Parkway. But it's always safe to bring up what's happening in space because everyone's eyes light up. And you would sometimes feel that people would push back and say, we should be spending more on our, our children or on education, all of which is true. But I've gotten very little the, the notion that we should abandon space to do even more here on the on our, so as, as you think about the agenda for your subcommittee, the Space and Aeronautics Subcommittee, um, it's, a, it's a broad agenda, right? You've got civil and commercial space, you've got aeronautical research and development, you've got demonstration. Um, what are the priorities that you'd like to put on the agenda of the subcommittee through this upcoming Congress? And what are the roadblocks that are going to stand in the way of the progress you're looking to make? Well, the biggest roadblock is just time. Because you're right, when we sat down um, with the staff, who is wonderful, uh, and, and my staff, and, and the various members of the committee, I've talked to every Democrat and a couple, and hopefully all of the Republicans on the subcommittee, saying, you know, what do you want to talk about? What, what should we study? Um, I got enough of what I thought was three years worth until I talked to the staff. And they said it's actually five years worth of hearings. Um, so the focus this year, though, is, is first and foremost to reauthorize the, the NASA uh, budget, the re NASA reauthorization. We have a head start, but we have a, a new you know, um, commandant with uh, Senator Nelson and a new president. So we'll have to look at it sort of through the Biden lens. But I very much hope that we can get that done this year. So one of the big issues that's faced NASA over the last many years is deteriorating infrastructure. And we now have a president that's proposed a large and ambitious infrastructure bill, the, the American Jobs Plan, that has as one of its major focuses building world-class transportation infrastructure. Uh, we haven't seen a lot about the space sector and space transportation figuring in there. But assuming that the American Jobs Plan moves forward in some form through Congress, do you have any priorities regarding NASA infrastructure that you think might belong in a final bill there? And I guess I'd yeah. ask that even more broadly, is if we're thinking about national competitiveness across the space sector, are there investments in broader space enabling infrastructure? Um, space situational awareness, maybe some of the dual purpose things the military does that you think should be considered? Yeah, yeah very, Dr. Warren, very much so. Both looking backwards and looking forwards. If we look backwards or even looking at today, NASA says we have a $2.6 billion backlog of just maintenance, deferred maintenance. You know, one is buildings, um, you know, the research facilities, the labs, things like that. But then looking forward, we really do want to have uh, cutting edge facilities, um, which is you know buildings, labs, wind tunnels, communications, mixture operations, all these things, um, in order to be able to uh, continue to lead the world and continue to fil fulfill our own dreams and objectives for, for NASA's goals. So, um, you know, we, we have a couple of different ways to approach this. Uh, the traditional way is uh, continuing to push forward NASA's annual budget. But then there's this unique opportunity, what Secretary Pete Buttigieg calls a, a once in a generation infrastructure opportunity to say, if infrastructure is not just roads and bridges, which the president says is not, then cer certainly we can think about NASA's infrastructure as part of that too. Yeah, one of the studies that our center did uh, late last year, and I think published early this year, focused on the space workforce. And I thought one of the notable things with the uh, president's infrastructure bill is it included human infrastructure in there and investment in science and technology, education, and topics like that, building the, you know, the strong human capital that we need for national competitiveness. Uh, 
there's a lot of really challenging issues involved in that, of course, because it's organizing a whole society. But do those kinds of issues come up in front of your subcommittee and do they generate bipartisan interest? You know, oh, Jamie, very much they do. In fact, one of the early hearings we had this year was the full committee, not just the space subcommittee, but the full science committee just on not just brain drain, but on the need to, to get ever more talent. You know, uh, there's so many anecdotes I could bring up. I, I met with a number of the Northern Virginia business leaders last week because they were so concerned they couldn't find the people that they need, the, the computer scientists. I remember in Virginia, the governor last year said, we, need, we have openings for 35,000 different cybersecurity experts. I, I, I did hear a fun thing this week, though. I was talking to uh, Dr. Wright, president of MIT, who said that their applications were up 46% this year. So maybe one of the unintended few happy consequences of the COVID pandemic was getting people much more interested in science and, and the difference it can make in our lives. But clearly, there are so many different initiatives on Capitol Hill and in the states. I got off a call with the governors a couple of minutes ago um, who are working on minimizing high school dropouts for the exact same reason that we need to have ever more investment in our human capital. And I'm very pleased that Joe Biden has expanded the definition of infrastructure to just mean investment in people and in capital that allow us to grow. Hmm. Do you do you see that this potential legislation and the work of uh, NASA and the other activity your subcommittee oversees as also contributing to uh, more equitable engagement uh, across society in these sorts of uh, extremely important activities? Yeah, I very much hope so. You know, uh, there are a number of, well, there's so much discussion right now. And I don't think it all started, started with George Floyd or Black Lives Matter. I think it's the larger understanding that um, the, the world that was dominated for so many millennia by uh, older white men like me, um, wasted an awful lot of an enormous talent. And what we're seeing is that those women who are left out of the sciences, the mathematics, the computer sciences, and, and the people of um, poverty, but also that, that often means people that were um, you know, raised in poor black neighborhoods or poor Hispanic neighborhoods, didn't have the access to, uh, to books, to the life of the mind, to the good schools, so sometimes even to two parents. Oh, what a waste, because we know that um, IQ is spread rather evenly across um, uh, all, um, all, all races, all, all individuals. So, you know, for every, you know, Bill Gates with, you know, 180 IQ born in Seattle to a wealthy family, there's another kid in some really tough neighborhood also born with 180 IQ. Uh, and if we could just find them and bring them up and give them the education that they need. Um, there, there are different studies that show GDP could be four, five, six percent higher just by taking the talent that we're now wasting and putting it back into the into the mainstream of science and productivity. That's an amazing productivity opportunity hanging out there. And certainly, uh, as we look across and in this study, as we looked across the space workforce, we saw a crying need to reach to broader pools. Uh, because not everybody is going to be interested in these topics and the competition for talent is truly intense. So great opportunities there, but people have to invest their personal time and energy to prepare for these kinds of careers. And so appreciate your Dr. engagement. Dr. That, yeah, Dr. Moore, you just think of, about women. One of my three daughters, a uh, linguistics major, right? Uh, fully prepared for life in the 18th century. So she took a, a summer coding course and she was the only girl out of about 40 kids in the class. She's 21 years old at the time. And they tried to put her into, uh, to break up into groups. And she refused because she said, every time she gets in a group, the, the boys take all the credit. So she was a group of one. And not surprisingly, she got the top grades in the entire class. All the boys wanted to be on her team after they saw what she could do. Well, you know that there are generations of women with that kind of intelligence who were you know, pushed off to the side to do daycare or maybe be somebody's office assistant uh, who really should have been running the world. 
And we will see uh, hopefully some great things in the years to come. Speaking of great things, right now uh, I'm seeing, and I'm sure you are, an enormous acceleration in commercial space. Uh, we're also seeing prospects of significant international collaboration on uh, cross-government civil space projects. Uh, we're seeing uh, interest across many nations and space agencies in activities in cis lunar space and you know more distant orbits. Do you think that NASA's role as an agency needs to change in light of all of this uh, activity that is coming from non-traditional sources or sources that would have been non-traditional 10 or 20 years ago? Yeah, and I do think, Jamie, that is changing as we speak. You know, if you jump back to Apollo, it's very clearly, this was NASA's uh, complete deal. And you sure they would contract out to private companies to make this part of that part or, or this engine, but it was still their product. They owned it at the end. But now we have you know, commercial crew and, and private carriers taking stuff up to ISS and back. And, and of course, the, the famous competition right now over the, the human lander for, for uh, the moon, uh, SpaceX versus Blue Origin versus Dynetics. Um, yeah, it's it's a very different world, and it's only going to get more uh, interesting and more complicated. And there will be competition. Um, I think the NASA's most optimistic Mars landing is 2033, but uh, Elon Musk thinks in this decade instead. We don't want to squash that kind of competition. That, that's actually good for us. There are um, going to be some difficult issues. For example, on, on HLS, which is under protest right now as we speak. Um, who owns it at the end? I think in the existing contract right now, if SpaceX continues to, to prevail, they'll own the, the lander um, after the US taxpayer has paid for it. Is that right? Um, but if it's not right, um, how do we sort those things out? So they're, they're, they're unresolved pieces of it, but the fact that commercial has gotten into this in a big way is very exciting. And among other things, uh, you know, we we're always looking for universal broadband. So the, the SpaceX provision of, of high, high speed broadband from satellites, I understand the waiting list is very, very long just here in Virginia. The, uh, there's a lot of excitement surrounding being uh, beta testers for some of these uh, novel technologies. That's for sure. The one of the areas that I've sensed some real progress in in the last uh, few years is a focus in the space sector on articulating the value of space to the average citizen. Do you see a, a role for your subcommittee and for Congress in general in helping to make those connections for people who, you know, may not be aware that their GPS signal is a space-based signal and that it is used for, you know, so many other things beyond just a blue dot on their phone, uh, or who don't see the, you know, that the weather data that they're relying on to plan their day? is a space-based service or that the, the farms that they're getting their food from are significantly more productive because of precision agriculture and enabled by space services. Is there a communications and education role that you see uh, coming with your new responsibilities as chair? Yeah, Dr. Warren, I, I definitely do. And if we're time limited um, on the committee, but uh, nothing would delight me more than a, a space committee hearing every week because there's so much to talk about. And when we can get the, the, the space press and also the mainstream press to pay attention to it, uh, because as you say, our whole understanding of weather is completely different because of, of our, our weather satellites. And one of the first things I do every morning before on my way into work is I check ways to see which way is the best way, the fastest way, the smartest way to get there, uh, and many, many other things. You know, it's it's interesting because there's a, on the one hand, space by itself is enough to inspire us, for us to think far beyond uh, our own lives and our own planet into projecting um, our 
our values, our consciousness, our humanity into space. But on the other hand, we really have learned so much about science and technology and about our own selves because of the investments that we made in space. It's a big story to tell. An exciting one, too. Um, speaking of major challenges facing everybody, uh, the president's talked very clearly about climate change as a top priority for the administration and the nation. Uh, the vice president, who's you know, announced that she's going to take an active hand in the National Space Council, has mentioned that climate is going to be a very key item on her agenda for NASA and for the space enterprise writ large. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you and how the subcommittee think about the role of space in addressing climate change? Well, I, I think it's, it is the thing that's most immediate, most urgent. I think as, as we look at our planet, um, you know, we can survive all kinds of natural disasters and we have through the, through the millennia, um, but the man-made disasters and climate change being the, the most important one, uh, supplanting uh, the destruction by nuclear arms um, is, is the thing that's changing all of our lives and frightening us and is the burden that we just can't pass on to our children and our grandchildren. And you know, much of what we know about climate change was discovered through NASA and certainly all of our uh, measurements are, are very much dependent on NASA's uh, measurement abilities. So. Um, our next space committee hearing is specifically on the, the earth science that NASA does. Um, I I'm often quote former NASA chief scientist, Ellen Stofan, who said that NASA is important to study all the planets, but the most important one is the one that we live on. And if this is our existential crisis for the 21st century, NASA plays the most central role. Well, we are absolutely delighted to have Ellen as one of the members of our senior advisory council for the center and uh, she's a national treasure doing great things at the Smithsonian right now. Uh, and it is great when you hear a, a planetary scientist like Ellen talk about the fascinating nature of all the planets, but especially uh, the one that most of us spend most of our time on. Uh, the speak, Thinking beyond just the uh, surface of the planet, we are seeing a lot of crowding in near earth orbits and that's uh that's really started a dialogue on space traffic management space debris uh, now in recent days a lot of discussion on orbital debris re-entry with the uh, uncontrolled re-entry of the chinese launch vehicle we've just seen um to be blunt i think we lost some time in recent years when the administration had a clear proposal for uh, where to lodge space traffic management, but the Congress you know, had a variety of views and we ended up not getting uh, any clear decision, right? Any clear uh, enabling of action yeah. in support of either the uh, previous administration's view that that activity should be lodged at the Department of Commerce or the view that, you know, others may have had that it should be at the FAA or, or other locations. What, what are your views on that topic? And what are the factors that play into it in your mind? Yeah, if I can go back, Dr. Moore, in 25 minutes to your opening question about what should our priorities be this year. Uh, I, I said NASA authorization, number one, but I think number two is trying to get our arms, our hands around that specific issue. Because we, and we've got two hearings planned for the fall, one on space traffic management, another on space orbital debris. Uh, but there, there are two sides of the, the same coin, although it's a terrible example. But, um, and so I, I don't want to offer a solution, but let me just talk about the fact, uh, A, there's the Defense Department that's been managing space traffic an awful lot because they have to with, with their sensitive equipment. And then you have the FAA that's been doing it uh, in real life. And the NASA that has all the wonderful measuring tools, but it's never been a regulatory agency. And then the plan to put it at the Department of Commerce, um, probably in the new Office of, of Space Commerce. Um, and, and there are pros and cons with, with every one of them. Um, I can't give you, yeah, I, I, I'm not wise enough to tell you what the right answer is. There's even a, a fifth or sixth notion, which is that we start something like the 
National Transportation Safety Board you know, that investigates you know major train and airline accidents, um, something like that, literally for space. That becomes a cooperative agency for commerce, FAA, DOD, NOAA, NASA, all to, to feed into. Um, but I'm hoping that by the time the end of this year comes that we have a, a clear proposal that we can sort right through uh, both, both the administration, the executive side and the Congress and move forward. Because you're right, we, we have lost some time and the problem is getting worse every day, not, not better. And once we figure out what to do here, we have to realize that, we are, that that space is an international community. An awful lot of other people putting things up in, in low earth orbit that have to be managed. And how do we do that in a cooperative way with China, Russia, India, et cetera? It's an increasingly democratized domain, right? With more and more players, private and governmental, and every nation has a different approach to licensing activity. Uh, so yeah, very difficult to organize in a, uh, in a global sort of way, but it is fundamentally a, a global problem. The, uh, my colleague at uh, Aerospace, uh, Dr. Joseph Kohler, has been doing some work on a space safety institute that may be uh, of interest to you in the committee as well. It, it, it has some of the attributes of what you're talking about. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe a matter for another conversation. The, you, you mentioned a need for additional insight to really understand this kind of issue and uh, the trade-offs that are involved. Uh, that takes me to a, a long time personal pet topic, which is uh, the challenge of getting objective advice for the Congress. Um, you know, back before your time in office, uh, in, in federal office, Congress had an Office of Technology Assessment that was created to bring it uh, reports on salient technology issues, you know, sort of a technology counterpart to the Congressional Budget Office or the, the CRS, the Congressional Research Service. Um, but that was shut down back in 1995, and we've sort of been left without a source for that kind of insight and some reliance on the CRS, some on the Government Accountability Office, but a real hole there. Is there any appetite among your colleagues for uh, something like that coming back? Yeah, Dr. Warren, I think there's quite a bit of appetite for it. And I've heard it mentioned many times in the last six months, especially after the, the last November election. Um, yeah, there's, there's a, a Luddite streak in the American character, uh, which doesn't skip Congress, uh, sadly. Uh, however, I think it's pretty clear that um, as technologically dependent as we were in 1995, we are much more so right now. And that bringing back the Office of Technology Assessment would be a great idea. Uh, I, I'm not aware that anyone has actually introduced legislation yet this year to do that, but I, I would not, I'd be astonished if it is, doesn't ex get introduced sometime in this calendar year. Now, how much it will be funded by and how much support it will have, I. I wasn't here for the first debate about why, why it was abolished, but it certainly seems necessary. Yeah, well, you know, it was never very large. I, I, I don't have the numbers at my fingertips, but I'm guessing it was 50 or 60 staff. Um, and I do believe that it was more of a, it was a casualty of budget cutting efforts, but it was more a casualty of perhaps bringing uh, answers to the four that were not the answers people were looking to hear, uh, which is, this is a, a perennial issue for uh, us at aerospace, you know, as a federally funded research and development center advising the government, we always feel like we've got to be able to bring unpleasant truths to the table, even if it's not what the agency wants to hear. So uh, that's something we've, uh, we've experienced the upside and downside of being a, a trusted advisor, uh, you know, because sometimes you do have to carry those unpleasant truths. So I don't begrudge the agency those challenges if they do, uh, if it is recreated. Uh, the reason well, I we, ask them- We often because, don't like what, yeah. we often don't like what the Congressional Budget Office tells us, <laughs> but we have to live with it anyway. 
Now that I can uh, sympath, I can definitely sympathize with having spent six years on the budget committee and the Senate uh, staff there. The uh, the reason I bring that topic up is that I I've sensed a real change in the in the spirit of the times. If you'd asked me ten years ago, uh, is there any appetite for industrial policy in American politics? You know, my answer would have been no. People want, people don't want to see uh, the government picking winners and losers. They don't want to see they want to see the government enabling. Uh, they have a minimum interest in government investments, even in sort of long term research and development areas that, uh, you know, are not going to benefit any one company, but might be a strong foundation for national competitiveness. It always seemed very, uh, you know, a, a lot of opposition there, but things seem to have really changed. And I don't know whether it's the language that you hear about great power competition or the recognition that technology is driving so much, but are you picking up that same sense in your colleagues and your constituents? Very much so. And there, there are so many different strands that pull together. Um, number one strand was sort of getting caught off guard during the pandemic with how many of our necessary supplies were um, offshore, uh, specifically in China, but even other places, that we didn't have the domestic capability to take care of ourselves. Um, so the, the notion of uh, what reshoring um, is, has really been around a bunch this year. Uh, then there's also the, the recognition that um, through many successful trade agreements, which made America overall healthier, it destroyed a lot of communities. And that we have an opportunity or responsibility to try to rebuild those communities. So a much more, you know, the whole notion of can we can we build it, build back better in America, including manufacturing a lot more of our own stuff. And then yet another thread is the whole debate right now about um, doubling or tripling the National Science Foundation budget. And um, both the Senate and the House provisions, two different bills, talk about focusing on specific areas that they want the National Science Foundation to be able to do basic research that will necessarily be translational in the short and middle run. In other words, um, cool basic research, but it's also stuff that's going to change our lives. That's a exciting challenge to offer uh, to the NSF. And I, it seems to me that there's a lot to be learned by looking back at the uh, 1940s and 50s as we were sort of setting up a national innovation engine and uh, really thinking hard about how we could compete for the long haul with the with the Soviet Union and uh, accentuate all of the you know best aspects of the American economy and society in order to maximize our uh, the welfare of the nation but also our competitiveness in the global environment. Let me ask so, you another so, question on slightly different. Oh, please go ahead. Oh, Jamie, so, so one of the questions that comes up is what's, what's the Bell Labs of today? You know, where is that partnership between industry and government uh, that, that will turn out uh, integrated circuits and transistors and, and the kinds of things that will, you know, the, the next generation of these ideas? those engines of innovation are, are really important and, and diverse, right? They, it's not all gonna come from one, one spot. Do, let me ask you a, a maybe an awkward question here. Um, as you've been spending even more time with the uh, space community, what do you think that people who work in the NASA sphere or in the national security space sphere are missing about our Congress and about the American people that you as a, you know, an elected official are maybe more in touch with than we are. Uh, what are there disconnects that we should be thinking about and working to address inside the space community? Jamie, I don't off the top of my head or even <laughs> thinking deeply for a second, I don't know of any real incongruities between or among the NASA staff and, and the public at large. Um, if, if to follow the, your train of thought, 
I think one place where people could learn from each other would be the commercial space sector, which is very innovation driven, but also profit driven. They have investors and they have to show a reasonable rate of return and they have to not go broke. Um, and every time there's a failure, you know, it's a it's a huge disaster because they're 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 losing private sector money. And NASA, which is government funded, on a, you know, it may be a fraction of what it was in 1969, but it's still you know more than 20 billion dollars, is to understand each other's perspectives, um, especially since we're going to be doing a lot more public private stuff in the years to come. So. Uh, uh understanding of how public and private equities come together and it can deliver maybe a whole that is greater than or at least uh, as large as the sum of its parts not smaller i, I like that it's a good point are, are do you think there is uh, work that needs to be done from a legislative perspective to enable more constructive partnership between the uh, public and private sector or do we have the framework in place to do what we need to do um, I think the framework's there, and I would be hard pressed in the short run to think of a specific legislative initiative. And you might find, you know, a pilot project here, a pilot project there. But I think already uh, NASA works so closely with um, the big players, you know, the, the Lockheeds and the North Northrop Grumman's, and lots and lots of small players that are, are, are deeply involved in it. Uh, David Thompson is an old friend from 30 years ago. I remember it was just David and a couple of people. Um, and the first four or five rockets all fell down. Um, so, you know, they were working closely. And, and uh, I think having that, the private sphere be, go from very small to very big gives the NASA folks lots of, uh, lots of different ways to interact and learn and teach. Uh, I will say uh, we have the... We have the privilege of having David on our board of trustees now for aerospace, and he is uh, he's a great source of insight. I, I really enjoyed getting to know him and working with him. Another uh, tremendous asset to the nation and somebody who's done great things across the sector. Do you um, where let me ask an, another kind of hard question of all of the exciting things that you're seeing out there? What excites you most? in space as we look to the future? Uh, let me give you two answers, um, both of them valid. Um, I think what excites me most in space is the idea that um, our humanity and our consciousness is so special. We still have no idea how life evolved. And even though we understand evolution sort of pretty well, we still have a very poor idea about how consciousness itself evolved. Um, this, this, um, this incredible creature that can see back almost to the very beginning of time, 13 and a half billion years ago, and can see forward to the end of this universe, and yet still are only gonna live to be 70 or 80 or 90 years old. Um, that's a, you know, the, the whole notion of that uh, uh, we are gods, um, and yet we are also very creaturely. And so the notion of taking humanity beyond this planet uh, to other planets, ultimately to the stars, I think is uh, really excites me. I would love to see the uniqueness of this consciousness spread throughout the universe. Uh, but the other part that really excites me is I love the, the cosmological thinking. And so when the James Webb Space Telescope gets up there, and when uh, Nancy Grace Roman, our W first successor, gets up there, we're just gonna learn so much more. I mean, I, I, I wanna know what dark energy is and dark matter and um, is the inflation theory real? And is there a multiverse? And all these cool things that may not affect our lives immediately, but certainly affect our imaginations. Well, and perhaps that's one of the great lessons of life in the political sphere is that imagination can be as powerful a force as almost anything else uh, in the world, since it can organize people to a degree that uh, other other aspects maybe won't be quite as quite as successful. Well, let me ask you, uh, Don, are there thoughts in closing that you would want to share with our audience? Any topics we missed because our view of the heavens was too narrow? 
Um, no, there's so much to talk about, but I, I do think that for, for me, the, the guiding principle of the space subcommittee and of NASA, which we're here there to support, is um, Moon to Mars, is getting men and women uh, of all colors on Moon for the first time and, 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 and then on Mars. Um, and that the Artemis 1, 2, and 3 is very exciting stuff. It's going to inspire the whole planet and hopefully lead to many, many, many other breakthroughs here as the young folks go off to Northern Virginia Community College and MIT and everything in between and, uh, and, and really advance our world. Well, I hope we can harness the power of space for inspiration for a lot of folks along that journey. And I hope that you've had a chance here uh, to the audience of the Space Policy Show to do a little bit of uh, inspiration as well. Uh, we're probably already mostly persuaded, but every little bit helps. We're grateful for your time today and for all the thoughts that you've shared with, uh, with us and look forward to seeing the work of the subcommittee in the coming year. Hope everybody tunes in uh, next week for another episode of the Space Policy Show. Thanks all. Thank you to Jamie and Representative Beyer. We hosted the previous chair of the subcommittee, Kendra Horn, on the Space Policy Show in January 2021. Be sure to check that out. Most shows are also available as a podcast or go to our website to browse collections of episodes grouped by topic area. Thanks to our terrific production team, Colleen Stover, James Liggins, and Jordan Bingham. Check us out on Twitter using hashtag the Space Policy Show and sign up for our latest news and alerts at aerospace.org slash policy. Be sure to look for our podcasts and share your favorite episodes with colleagues. Stay tuned for more to come on the Space Policy Show. Next week, we will feature space workforce development with Mandy Vaughn and Mir Sadat. Until then, take care.